Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, where we dig into the reliability of the Bible. I'm your host, Henry Smith. Today, Brian Wendell joins us from Canada to take us on a journey through the life of Pharaoh Necho of Egypt, who is connected to three major events recorded in Holy Scripture. Brian, great to have you back on Digging for Truth, my friend. Good to see you. Thanks so much, Henry. Good to see you again. All right, we're going to be talking today about Pharaoh Necho. Uh, why don't you begin by talking a little bit about uh, um, this guy? Give us some, give us some background. Tell us uh, what you're thinking about him. Yeah, well, I love I do these uh, archaeological biographies for my website, BibleArchaeologyReport.com, and um, I, I do them because, um, well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I love history. And um, I find the more that I research people like Pharaoh Necho and the other rulers who are named in Scripture, the more uh, my faith is encouraged, the more my faith is built up. And, and then I, it also helps me contextualize what I'm reading in the Bible. And so um, you know, sometimes we read these stories and, and they've got you know, rulers with, with uh, strange names and um, and we're, we're sometimes people read them and they think, well, wow, they're just kind of maybe far off or fiction, like the kings of of Gondor or uh, or elsewhere in the Lord of the Rings. And so um, the thing about the thing about the Bible is that it's describing actual people in 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 authentic places. It's describing accurate history. And so when we come to Pharaoh Necho, um, who's named in the Bible, that's Pharaoh Necho the second, who we know from Egyptian history, um, the more we know about his life, the more it helps us understand those glimpses we see of him in the Bible. And so it, it helps me not only to build my faith, it helps me to, um, helps me to understand the Bible better. All right, so uh, give us a tutorial, Brian, on the world in which Pharaoh Necho lived. Yeah, Necho lived a very interesting time in history when you've got uh, all of these competing empires. Um, so to understand the reign of Pharaoh Necho, we need to understand the geopolitical situation uh, at that particular time. So Assyria had been the prevailing world power, and uh, but her dominance was beginning to fade and the Neo-Babylonian Empire was starting to grow and flex its might. And so um, some kingdoms had rebelled against Assyrian control. Um, our listeners might remember that Hezekiah was one of those who rebelled against uh, Sennacherib. Uh, but, but the kings of the 26th dynasty to which Pharaoh Necho II belonged actually established uh, relations with Assyria. They were Assyria's allies. And so Necho I uh, the grandfather of Necho II, he was the one who established, he became an ally of Assyria. And, and so they that continued with his son. And then when Necho II um, became Pharaoh, he took over as well. Um, and so they were, Assyria helped in, in driving out the Nubian pharaohs of the 25th dynasty, which helped establish the 26th dynasty and um, in terms of their rule over all of Egypt. And so um, Necho II, when he became the pharaoh, he inherited a fairly stable Egypt at that point that was experiencing a bit of a renaissance in art and culture and writing. And so um, Necho II uh, reigned from uh, a city called Sais. Uh, so those pharaohs of the 26th dynasty are known as the Sait pharaohs. And, um, and he maintained his loyalty to the Assyrian kingdom and uh, started thinking the grandiose designs for Egypt like the pharaohs of old did. Yeah, so we're talking 26th dynasty, so later period in biblical history around 600 BC, and you'll talk more about that here in a moment. So tell us what the Bible says about him specifically, because it actually names him by name and in, in important ways. Please share that. Yeah, well, there are many pharaohs that are referred to in Scripture. Um, in the earlier periods in the book of Genesis, the pharaohs are not named, and that is in keeping with the convention that we know of from history at Moses' time. Moses wrote uh, the book of Genesis. So while we have multiple pharaohs in Genesis, they're not named. We're not really sure uh, of who they are. But then when we get into the later period, as you mentioned, the pharaohs are named um, in writings, and that's in keeping with the convention 
um, when those books were written. And so there are five pharaohs who are uh, named by scripture in the Bible. There's the pharaoh Shishak. We've done a Digging for Truth episode on him. Um, there is uh, Terhaka or uh, uh uh, Terhaka, depending on which pronunciation you use. He was a Nubian pharaoh of the 25th dynasty. Uh, pharaoh Hophra, who's better known by his Greek name, Apries. Uh, pharaoh So, who is likely Osorkin IV. And finally, uh, Pharaoh Nico II. And if uh, viewers are interested, I've written a, a, a blog on each one of these, an archaeological biography, but we're going to focus on Pharaoh the Neko II today. And uh, he is, um, he ruled from 610 to about 595 BC, and he's named in eight verses in the Bible in connection with three main events. The first one, and probably uh, one of the ones he's best known for um, uh, through, to biblical scholars, is, is the fact that he is the one who defeated, who killed King Josiah of Judah in a battle at Megiddo in 2 Kings 23. Subsequent to that, he... Um, chose a new vassal king for Judah. He put a new king on the throne, King Eliakim, and, um, and put him on the throne. And we told that in 2 Kings 23 at the end of the verse. And then um, probably what he's best known to history uh, for is the fact that he was defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, who at that point was the crown prince of Babylon at the Battle of Carchemish. And we read about that in Jeremiah, 20, uh, Jeremiah 46, verses 2 and 3. So outside of these eight verses, these three events, that's all the information we get in the Bible which is where archaeology comes in and, and, and other historical writings. It helps provide a bigger picture of who this person was and what the background to these events in Scripture was. Yeah, so it's, it's amazing to me. And we've said on this program many times, but maybe for someone who's watching for the first time, how you know the Bible is sufficient in and of itself for what God wants to tell us, that we can understand it when we read it and, and that sort of thing. It's essential message and purpose that God has. But then the beauty of archaeology is especially this background that you're discussing and we're going to get into that really helps us understand our Bibles even better and helps transport us into that time a little bit more concretely. Well, I'm here today with my colleague and friend, Brian Wendell. We're talking about Pharaoh Necho of Egypt in the 26th dynasty, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Pharaoh Necho of the 26th dynasty of Egypt. Who was he and how is he related to the Bible? Well, Brian Wendell's here to tell us all about it. Brian, uh, in our first segment, we covered some basics, but uh, before we get to the events uh, in the Bible itself, let's talk a little bit about what we know uh, about Pharaoh Necho outside the Bible, and then we'll do some integration as we go through the show. Yeah, so why don't we start with uh, the city of Sais. Uh, Sais, Egypt, is where the pharaohs of the 26th dynasty um, ruled from. Um, and uh, according to Penny Wilson, Penny Wilson is the field director uh, of the exploration project at Sais. I was actually emailing with her yesterday. She's there at Sais in Egypt right now, um, continuing the, uh, the uh, exploration of that site. And uh, she's noted that the pharaohs of the 26th dynasty invested heavily in building this capital city um, to be like the grandiose capital cities of the past with a, with a palace, garrisons for soldiers, and, and temples for the sate gods. Uh, unfortunately, there, there really is not a lot left there uh, today. Um, in the northern part of the site, they were able to identify the remains of these massive mud brick walls surrounding this huge enclosure. And uh, they believe that this was likely the royal palace of the pharaohs of the 26th dynasty. So likely the place where Necho uh, ruled from when uh, dwelt when he ruled there. Um, and, and then we, we, so we have archaeology, which helps us a little bit. And then we also have other historical uh, sources. And one of the main ones that we have is um, Herodotus. And Herodotus portrays Necho as this great builder and warrior. He, he records that Necho 
uh, began to build a canal to uh, the Red Sea. So this is before the Suez Canal. He took it upon himself that he was going to build this canal. He sent um, he sent Egyptian and Phoenician sailors. He wanted them to sail completely around all of the continent of Africa. So he he had this idea of exploration, and then and then he he led a campaign into Syria. Herodotus writes this. He says he stopped work on the canal and engaged in preparations for war. Some of his ships of war were built on the Northern Sea and some in the Arabian Gulf by the uh, Red Sea coast. The winches for landing these can still be seen, Herodotus writes. In his day, they could still be seen. He used these ships when needed, and with his land army, he met and defeated the Syrians at Magdal- uh, Magdalus, taking the great Syrian city of Catatus after the battle. And so Herodotus, uh, Herodotus rather, um, displays, uh, portrays Necho as this uh, great explorer, this great, um, this warrior um, pharaoh. Well, since Brian, he's portrayed as a warrior, uh, let's let's talk about the, you know, the battles in the Bible that he's involved in. Um, let's start with what is the most famous, the battle against uh, King Josiah and the result of that. Yes. Yeah, so in 2 Kings uh, 23, 29, we read this. It says, in his day, that's King Josiah's day, Pharaoh Necho of Egypt went up to the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went out to meet him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him in battle as soon as he saw him. So what we're given is just this, this bare bones statement of what happened. And so I... I'm left to think, what was Josiah thinking? Why was Necho heading up to um, where the Assyrians were? What is what is the background to this? And that's where um, understanding some of the history, some of the archaeology helps us to fill in uh, the picture. And uh, and it, it illuminates why Josiah would run to, to battle with uh, Pharaoh Necho. And so uh, remember, um, the Egyptians and the Assyrians are allies at this particular point, and and they're against the Babylonians, and so um, and so that's part of the background to what's happening at this particular point in history, and so uh, the Babylonians when they uh, when they destroyed the city of Nineveh. Um, they drove the Assyrians away, and the Assyrians went north to Haran and set up a new capital city there. And then the Babylonians came up and and defeated them at Haran, and and the Assyrians fled from there. But the Assyrians wanted their city of Haran back, and so they came back and they attacked uh, the city of Haran there. And and the Egyptians are coming to help their allies, Assyria, try and take this uh, this city back from the Babylonians. Now remember that. Judah, Josiah of Judah, um, is more in line with the Babylonian way of thinking at this point. Remember when uh, Hezekiah had had entertained um, envoys from Babylon who were trying to to convince him to join a rebellion against Assyria. And so you've got these two competing groups. You've got Egypt and Assyria allied, and you've got Babylon and Judah, who maybe are not fully allies here, but certainly would have uh, uh, similar ideas and a similar entity, uh, enemy. And so uh, Egyptologist uh, Donald Redford kind of gives a good background to this. He says, for a century, ever since the overtures of uh, Marduk Baladin II to Hezekiah, Judah had perceived itself sharing a community of interest with Babylon in international politics. Josiah simply saw himself as an ally of the forces of right in the destruction of Assyria. And so he marches out to cut off Pharaoh Necho and the Egyptians from coming to the aid of the Assyrians because he's trying to help the Babylonians in this, and it was a, a fatal decision for him. Uh, even though Necho warned him not to, he came anyways. And we're told in Second Chronicles thirty-five that archers from Egypt shot and killed King Josiah, and so Egypt continued on. Uh, they helped the Assyrians. They tried to take um, the city of Haran, but they didn't. The Babylonian chronicle uh, tells us what happened. It says the king of Assyria and a large army from Egypt that would be the forces of Necho II, crossed the river and marched on to conquer Haran. His army entered it, but the garrison of the king of Akkad, that's Babylon, had le- uh, had left there. The garrison he'd left there killed and defeated them. And so the Egyptians and the Assyrians were unsuccessful in retaking Haran. 
Egypt left to go back to Egypt. On the way back, this is where we're told about the second uh, thing that he did. He stopped, and uh, we read in 2 Kings 30, 23, 34, that Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, the king in the place of Josiah, his father, and changed his name to Jehoiakim. But he took Jehoiahaz, who the people of Judah had set up as king after Josiah died. He took that, him and came to Egypt, and that's where he died. And so uh, Necho, at least for a brief period of time, it seems, established control over at least Judah at this point in history. Excellent. Excellent. Well, on the other side of the break, Brian, we're going to get to another battle that uh, Necho was involved in. And after uh, we'll get to that right after this message. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. We're walking through the history of Pharaoh Necho of Egypt with Brian Wendell, a, a ABR staff member, pastor, and uh, studying to be an archaeologist. Uh, Brian, all right, we talked about uh, the uh, defeat of Josiah at the Battle of Megiddo, but we have another battle, the Battle of Carchemish. Let's talk about it. Yeah, so this is uh, another... A mention of Pharaoh Necho in Scripture. Jeremiah talks about him and um, mentions this famous battle from history, the Battle of Carchemish, and um, and Necho was defeated there. Uh, what we read in Jeremiah forty six two to three is this about Egypt. The prophet writes concerning the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates at Carchemish, and which. King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Babylon, defeated in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, prepare buckler and shield, advance for battle. So we know that this happened from history. We know this happened in the spring of 605 BC. Um, Nebuchadnezzar actually isn't king just yet. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, his father is, and, and he is the crown prince. And so he is in charge of the army at this point. And he marches on Carchemish, where the Egyptian army is wintering. And he soundly defeats Necho's troops. Uh, and this is the event to which um, Jeremiah the prophet is referencing. And so with that, Babylon essentially took control over northern Syria and, and ended the um, Egyptian control at that particular area. And, um, and in fact, several years later, we know from history that Nebuchadnezzar uh, and the Babylonians tried to invade Egypt. Well, they did invade Egypt. Um, they weren't able to conquer Egypt. They did come in. There were battles. Um, and I'm sure they caused a lot of destruction. But, but they weren't able to actually uh, wrestle control away from Necho at that time. And so uh, they went back to Babylon. And it appears that he spent his latter years... Um, kind of sowing anti-Babylonian uh, sentiment in the area. But uh, this defeat at the Battle of Carchemish really, um, really influenced moving forward his, uh, his, the way he was viewed, uh, particularly at that period in time. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable to me. You know, we've, we've talked about this numerous times, but it, it, bear, it always bears repeating of the particularity of these of these texts, how they, of course, give us the background, but also the chronology. We have things like the spring of 605 BC and then 601 BC. I mean, it's really remarkable uh, how how the biblical text correlates with these archaeological discoveries, especially during this period, right, of history. Uh, what a what a blessing it is for us to have that. So, Brian, your assessment of of, of Pharaoh Necho. Um, I, I don't know. You get the sense here. Is, is this guy, uh, if you want to use the common vernacular, is he a loser? Is he a winner? Is he, is he both? What, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's a hard one, right? Um, I, I think 
he maybe has been a little bit unfairly judged, particularly if you read a little bit about that particular point in history. Um, Egyptologist Nicholas Grimal remarks, his reputation with both contemporaries and subsequent generations was very poor, despite the fact that he appears to have passed on a certain degree of prosperity to his successors. Uh, Redford, another Egyptologist, summarizes, among the members of the 26th dynasty, Neko II has received the worst press, a man of action from the start and endowed with an imagination perhaps beyond that of his contemporaries. Neko had the ill luck to foster the impression of being a failure. In hindsight, his bent to action was perceived as impetuosity and his imagination unrealistic dreaming. And so... That may be a little harsh, but it seems that that was the reputation he had at that particular time and in subsequent generations. But when you look at um, what Herodotus describes, when you look at these glimpses that we see in the Bible, we see a pharaoh who has uh, taken over parts of the southern Levant, establishing control for a period of time over Judah, um, and and coming to the aid in you know even in northern Syria. Of the uh, of the Assyrians, and so this is a man who has has led uh, Egypt and uh, continued the prosperity that he inherited. And so I'm not sure that we can uh, we can just look at him and see uh, a pharaoh who was just a loser. Um, he lost a key battle, um, but he was able to defend Egypt against the Babylonians. It appears, and so um, he's a little bit of a mixed bag. Well, that's very good, uh, and I, I want to encourage our audience. Uh, to check out Brian's uh, blog, Bible Archaeology Report, where uh, often he'll write an accompanying article to go with uh, our episodes like this one. And if you're more inclined to read or you want to supplement uh, your research with what we're discussing, we invite you to go to Brian's blog. It's very well done and uh, just a really a great compliment to our, our TV show and also to the Ministry of ABR. Okay, Brian, so uh, we got a few minutes left here, a couple minutes. Uh, what can we what can we learn from all of this? Uh, again, we've we've gone through a biography of a person in the Bible, and we found all, all of these connections between the history, archaeology, and the biblical text. Yeah, I think um, in this regard, two things. I mean, we've said time and time again, Henry, on digging digging for truth, that the beauty of our, of biblical archaeology is that it affirms Scripture and it illuminates Scripture, and so. We have uh, these two key battles that are described in uh, the Bible, and we know from from uh, Babylonian sources, from from Herodotus, we know about these particular battles. It'll it what we see in the Bible lines up with what we see in Scripture, even to the point of the chronology at this particular period of time. So there's this affirmation that's happening. But for me, and particularly for Pharaoh uh, Necho, and and for the whole um, issue of why Josiah would would go to attack Necho, um, this is where I think we really see the beauty of of archaeology and history, is that it provides the, the background to help us understand What's in Josiah's mind? He's been warned. Why is he going out? And so, um, so I, I think it's it it serves both of these purposes. And, and the more I study, the more I study the lives of the rulers that are named in Scripture. I I the more the Bible comes alive to me. The more I understand it. The more uh, my faith is built. And and I often say it. it it's actual people, it's authentic places, it's accurate history. That's what the Bible is. And I believe if we can trust what it says historically, we can trust what it says spiritually when it describes the good news of Jesus coming to seek and to save sinners. Well, amen to that, Brian. Thank you for once again for an excellent show together. It's a privilege to serve our Lord with you and uh, we're looking forward to having you on again. Uh, we've got lots more to talk about, even though we've done a lot of shows together. So thank you so much. Thanks, Henry. Friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. I'm reminded today just a little bit about these battles from ancient history, right? That uh, humanity since the fall has been engaged in these terrible wars. Uh, they're a part and parcel of a fallen world. And we should be reminded today that those things will continue to take place until Jesus returns. And so we just want to we want to encourage you to consider turning your life to Christ for the forgiveness of sins and being part of his kingdom because someday a day is going to come when he restores the world 
and there will be no more death through war or any other way. And uh, that is the great news of the gospel of Jesus. And we hope you embrace that truth today. Thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV. Positively different.